Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of A Fork in Time. I uh, This is Chris Coppola. Most of you probably know me. I'm, I don't know. Am I a host? Am I a guest? Yeah. I, I Whatever. Uh, and I am today uh, joined by Don, the originator, the founder of the show. I am currently doing, you know, when you try and get your driver's license, you're not allowed to drive alone for a certain amount of time. So we're documenting this. I need to get in like five hours of observed podcast hosting. So uh, let's start this. Don, you want to say hello to everybody? Hello, everybody. And uh, Chris, yeah, I don't think you even knew, know this. I don't think we ever talked about this. Briefly during college, I did some work for a driving school. And so I've been in the cars that have the brake on the passenger side. And so there was a period of time where I actually, you know, have tried to put my foot through the floor of, of passenger side uh, front seat floorboards that don't have a brake because I was trying to actually hit the brake. So uh, I don't think I'll have to worry about hitting the brake, but I have experience with uh, tapping the brake from the, what the, what the British would say is the correct side of the car. What we think is the wrong side of the car. We, we, we do have a mute button. We can work on that. We can always do that. So um, this is the first episode of kind of a, I don't want to call a story arc, but, but a series that we've been discussing, kind of focusing around the presidency of JFK. Um, one of the things that we, I will give credit, this was that, that, that Don said, but I wholeheartedly agree with, was when we started this, we will have jumped the shark when we do the episode on the assassination we are not going down that road but there are a lot of other things i i I'm, i actually realized he's one of the shortest presidencies of in u.s history but there's a lot of offshoots from it so we thought it's november let's go ahead and start a theme and uh so for the next month, you're going to be hearing about different themes, different ideas around the currents going on during his presidency. Um, and today's episode is focused around the election of 1960. More specifically, we're going to talk about the lead up, the campaign leading to the election of 1960 and one of the most famous, um, probably the first presidential debate ever televised uh one of the you know in the off podcast discussions don mentioned yeah this is something he studied in political science classes and what we're going to talk about is the first debate between senator john f kennedy from massachusetts and the sitting vice president of the united states richard nixon um don do you have anything you want to fill in yeah, just, you know, the, I think the classic thing there, this is probably not new to most of our listeners. And they, you know, they I think it's an interesting point that you make for a short presidency, it's it's jam packed, for, you know, for uh, for JFK. But also, you know, for our listeners, you probably have heard, you know, th- this debate is famous. One of the big things, you know, talking about things like missile gaps and other things like this. So there was a lot of substance, a lot more substance in debates back then there is today. We'll just leave it at that without, you know, chasing that that little woodland creature into the brush as well. But uh you know, television was certainly a wide a wide phenomena by that point. Uh, black and white TV, small black and white TV. I'm sitting here looking at my computer screen now. If your TV was the side of size of this computer screen, that probably was about the norm for a lot of folks in many instances. But uh, radio was still a very popular medium by which people consumed, you know, news and everything else. And one of the things I remember most about that is they talked about a telegenic, photogenic, you know, young Kennedy who was, you know, just you know, probably I think it's empirically true was more attractive than Nixon at any point in his life, you, you know, whatever the case might be. But also the fact that uh, that one of the things that happened during the debate was Nixon chose not to wear makeup 
um, for television. And the lighting was, you know, the lighting was harsh and heavy. And there was a reason that people wear makeup on TV. It's to take care of some of these things that go around that. And so Nixon's refusal to do that and, you know, the sweating, you know, that, that came, other things. And so the, the classic thing that you hear, bring it all together, is there were a lot of people, regardless of their bend, who they were favoring or thinking they were going to favor in this very close election. And that's something I know we'll talk about, was that. Most of the people that listened to the debate on the radio thought that Nixon had carried the debate pretty handily, whereas people that watched the debate on TV had a different perspective on that. So what's the difference between the two mediums? Well, the words are all the same. The questions are all the same. The content, the substance is all the same. So it had to do with something about the presentation. And so you know, I, what we talked about is potentially our, our jumping off point here for this episode. What changes, what changes history is, well, a little bit of makeup, <laughs> perhaps, uh, because if, you know, if Nixon is judged to have fared better in the debate more broadly in a close election, you know, aside from all the other ways you could change the election, because that's also something, Chris, you, you and I talked about off podcast, there's, there's 10,000 different ways you could tweak this election probably because it's so close. Uh, what if it's just that debate, you know, something that is easily latched onto being the reason why? So, uh, yeah, that's again, it's 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 sort of a well-known anecdote, I think, in American political history, but it, it's real in the sense that there was a different perception that happened. Right. So uh, we are going to take a break right now for, you know, words from our sponsors, I guess, and. Uh, When we come back, we will start talking about this. Here's Don. And Alexis. Taking just a quick break from the podcast today to tell you about, again, something that is relatively new for us. Uh, So what is this new, exciting thing that we're sort of pumped about? Merchandise. Merchandise. We're a podcast. They can have those. They can have items. Wow. This opens up a whole new world, world of possibilities. And so what we're referring to here is the fact that you may have been craving, absolutely craving, wondering how in the world you could get your hands on what? Maybe a a fork in time. T-shirt. Or coffee mug. Yeah, coffee mug is a big thing for me. Or maybe even a cell phone cover or a tote bag or any of the other types of things. The good news is now you're able to do that. And we found a way to do that that works well for us and we think that will work well for you. So one of the folks that we partnered with is Public. And Tee Public is actually a place for designers to sort of post things that are, are graphical or art-oriented. I got this idea from another podcast that does this. So we're able to have our logo as an option that you can then put on the various Tee Public apparel. Mm-hmm. So, Alexis, how does it work if you go to our website and click on the link that says Get Some Logo Stuff? So when you click on that link, it'll take you to the Tee Public site, and you can pick from... Several different options, which we kind of mentioned. There are other ones, too. So you can really pick what you want with our logo on it. And then when you purchase that, we actually get a little help. Yeah, it's not a lot. Uh, this is not going to be a... Uh, I'm not retiring on our tea public income no. um, ever. Uh, but it does offset a little bit of the cost of the show. But more importantly, it's a way of doing this where we don't have a lot of upfront cost in terms of printing, you know, a thousand t-shirts, because that's where you get the best right. So it's just a good way of doing that, taking advantage of the mechanism that Public has in place. So if you enjoy the show and you want to rep the show to those around you, you have a way to do that through logo apparel and items and all kinds of other stuff. And you can find how to get there by going through the website. So one more time, what is our website address, Lex? That is aforkintimepodcast.com. You can use that merchandise and also it'll help you start a conversation with somebody about the podcast too. Hey, there's an idea. So we hope that you do. Thanks. Welcome back to A Fork in Time. Today's episode is about the presidential debate, uh, the televised presidential debate from, was it, what was it, October 1960? 1960 campaign. And um, so, yeah, getting into this, um, Nixon wears makeup. Um, we, we, we talked about that. We, the one thing I did look up and I find really interesting kind of in – as somebody who's been separated from that period of history, who learned it as history, um, you always think of Kennedy as generationally different. And he did make it a big point to talk about, you know, he's the World War II generation. Nixon was four years older than him. That's yeah, it. 
I think that's an interesting point, Chris. I was thinking about that as well. It's one of those things of, you know, perception versus reality. Part of it was Nixon had been in the public, in the in the broader national public mm-hmm. eye for longer than Kennedy had. So you know, that, that's part of what causes that. But, you know, four years is nothing. But you, if you, I think if you ask the average person, if you'd asked me without you stating that fact first, I would have said, well, I would have stopped and thought for a minute. Yeah, they both served during the war. I would have guessed maybe closer to seven or eight because I would have still made it wider than what it was probably. But four years is nothing. Well, four years is a presidential term. Right, right. And yeah, so our jumping off point is Richard Nixon appears better and is able to convince people he's got that vibrancy. And I think that's one of the other interesting things. Keeping in mind, we are just coming out of Eisenhower, who, while he served in the war, served in a very different capacity, definitely was from a previous generation, and had in office experienced health crises that Richard Nixon stepped in. You know, this is one of those things kind of like, um, I'm trying to think of, well, comes to mind the Woodrow Wilson when he had a stroke in office and they kept it very secret. But Eisenhower had serious health crises as well in office. And it's one of those murky things people don't talk about is who was in charge. But, uh, but, but by the way, Chris, just an aside yeah. there, we, we encourage our listeners all the time to send us in suggestions. And some of them we've never gotten around to yet. So that people go, why bother doing that? Uh, actually, Eisenhower's heart attacks is a suggested topic for an episode that we've received. So we'll, yeah. we'll probably get around to that at yeah. some point. So um, Richard Nixon comes off better and is inaugurated in January on January 20th, 1961. He takes over as president of the United States. So in in my mind and in, in coming up with this the first thing i thought about was how is that going to change kind of two things first is going to be foreign policy um and the one thing that i immediately think about is the vienna meeting between in our time between kennedy and and khrushchev um if it's a nixon khrushchev meeting i really do think that the history of that changes that that's a really different significance of that meeting reason i say that is in our timeline the vienna meeting is there there, there's two things that come out of it one is khrushchev looks at kennedy and thinks you're a kid there's no way i can keep up with you he also looks at kennedy and says you're a kid you know what, I could probably take advantage of you. And you're a little wetter behind the ears. You don't have that experience of dealing on an international stage, even though you know Kennedy was an internationalist. He was kind of came in as a foreign policy president. Um, Nixon had already, Nixon had debated Khrushchev on television right. already. Back in 1957, as vice president, there was an exhibition in Moscow, and he had a televised debate with Khrushchev. And I think they knew each other. I think um, that experience and what leads the decisions that are made by Khrushchev after that meeting, specifically um, in Berlin, And really, if you look at a lot of the scholarship, people say one of the reasons Khrushchev thought he could get away with the Cuban Missile Crisis is because he thought Kennedy was an inexperienced um, negotiator, an inexperienced statesman. Nobody thought that about a two-term vice president. Right, and and particularly what what Nixon had been during that during that presidency, and even, you know, even before that, what 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 caused him to rise to prominence, even is, you know, is his willingness to uh, to be bold and obviously decisive about about what he thought as well. It, you know, to, to me, the interesting thought that's there is, you know, you know, this also gets back into things we've talked about so many times about which theory of history you subscribe to. Mm. You know, how much is um, how much is 
the macro forces of what's going on in the world versus uh, the micro forces of, uh, of an individual. Uh, I'm going to take a little detour here, but I promise it's, it's worth taking. Even though Chris is driving the car, I, I tapped on the brake on the passenger side here a little bit. You said it's, brake, uh, not steering wheel. Yeah. Well, this is yeah. getting more complicated. Yeah. And there's no, never no clutch on the other side either. But the, uh, um, if you're familiar with actually, it, the reason I bring this up is it's actually on, on Apple TV right now is uh, an adaptation of Isaac Asimov's foundation science fiction um universe and i wouldn't call it exactly a, a an adaptation of his novel it's sort of one of those inspired by they've actually done some very interesting things because if you know that as a fan of science fiction i happen to be a fan of that series by asimov and and what's going on there but i, I promise this ties in we'll end up using it more because it ties back to a lot of what we do here on a fork in time but the concept in asimov's foundation is this idea of psycho history if you have large numbers of people like a galactic empire it's possible to apply statistical analysis to figure out what's going to happen and you can predict the future because you're dealing with the powers of large numbers and so this is around this concept that there's someone who has predicted the fall of this galactic empire in a certain number of years and the machinations that come off the backside of that and so time and time again in, in the book and in the series it's no that only works with large numbers you can't apply this technology or this science or this understanding to an individual or to too small a group. So when I hear that, because of the discussions we've had here on the podcast so many times about, you know, that sort of macro view of the flow of history versus the, 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 you know, the, the, the big man, the important man, the influential you know, individual in history sort of concept, you know, that, that, that gets churned up for me because of what we do here on the podcast. And I think this is another good example of that, you know, how much of, so much when we think about that period of time was Kennedy or was Nixon or was, you know, versus just the macro forces that were going on in the Cold War world and, you know, everything else. And so, you know, is Khrushchev making a decision that's political calculus based upon the relative strengths of the Soviet Union and the United States? Yes. But is he also making decisions based upon the personal calculus of me versus him versus there could have been another him, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and yeah. And I guess, you know, the, the way to bring that all home is that fact that in an authoritarian type of scenario, I mean, Khrushchev had to answer to others, the Politburo to some degree in the apparatus, but he was in a position to sort of make decisions somewhat unilaterally, unlike, you know, the situation for an American president where that's, that's tougher to do. And so it becomes easier for that influential man or, you know, that, concept of history to come into play when that person has more power an emperor of rome can be more the one man changing history than you know than the mayor of than the mayor of nome alaska just to try to you know do something clever there with the words so you, I, I agree you did uh, see i would have gone rome new york you don't well, even have to rhyme it yeah i was i was actually trying to think of a, of a, of a city in the united states that was rome and <laughs> one there is one here in texas because i think we have every foreign capital of the uh, of the world represented by a city name in te Texas. We have an Athens, we have a Paris, we have a, so I think there's a Rome someplace, but yeah, we, we've now, we've now gone so far off the path that we're going to have to chop weeds to get back to it. But uh, it, it is but, that, yeah, like, I, I think it is that point yeah. of the difference between the macro forces of history. Again, that sort of idea of psycho history from foundation, where if you've got trillions of people, you can, you know, think about what that means, you know, almost statistically versus, does one person make a difference? And we argue a lot in alternate history that one person or one event makes makes a difference. You did kind of bring up an interesting thing that tacks nicely onto the end of where I was talking about, which is Khrushchev was not it, it, as long as the Soviet Union lasted. Each one of the leaders of it had a really different political system under them um it is inconceivable that stalin would have faced any kind of internal dissension basically as soon as he was there he was leaving off his feet first that's how things were going to happen right. um khrushchev not so much he came after stalin and had a really different political you know, no, not a constitutional change, but a the political structures changed. And I think one of the interesting things was 
Khrushchev was a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more confrontational with the West. But one of the things was Cuba, Cuba, Cuba. And he did not last two years after the withdrawal from Cuba because the powers that be, the support he kind of had to balance internally within the Soviet Union, decided that they no longer wanted to back him. We just said Cuba may not happen. Yeah. And that's the interesting part to me is that as much as this period of history is, you know, focused on, I think in modern history, outside of the world wars in, in the, in the 20th century, that period there, you know, in the early sixties tends to be the, you know, the focal point for all types of discussion, debate, you know, good, good TV, interesting documentaries, the whole bit, especially around the personality of a Kennedy, you know, and, and then what happens there. But um, the, I think it's hard for us to imagine a different path for Cuba because we have the path that we do. But, you know, if there's a different path for Cuba, there's a different path for a lot of things that happens after that point, in my opinion, too. That, that's where this alternate timeline of, you know, if somehow changing, if a, if a more persuasive makeup artist prior to mm-hmm. the uh, prior to the 19, 1960 presidential debate, by the way, the first time it was ever televised, which is also what's unique about that. So that, that wasn't even something that you thought about beforehand. You know, probably they get there and they they say, Mr. Nixon, you need to go over there and sit in that chair so we can put the makeup on. And he probably says, no, I'm not wearing makeup. What are you talking about makeup, you know, kind of thing. The, the other thing, just tangentially, another addition to the reason he looked so haggard, um, he was fighting off, you know, and he didn't run a test beforehand, but basically there's the suggestion that he had some kind of cold or flu, which is one of the reasons he did not look so good. Yeah. In Yeah. And, 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 ha- and hadn't shaved, you know, so he didn't mm-hmm. think about the fact, you know, I, Chris can see that I haven't shaved here, you know, the impact or that I can see him on my screen as well. You know, the, the other side of that, of course, is, you know, I, don't know if we've exactly hit our jump off point. Maybe we need to do that here at some point. But the other interesting thing is that we know that Kennedy suffered tremendously from the back pains and the other things that were there. And at least for, for the, for the debates, he made sure that he was on the proper medication so that he was his, he was his best self physically uh, for that event, you know, versus in this case, Nixon under the weather and not having properly shaved uh, refusing makeup. By the way, he only refused makeup for the first debate. He didn't do that for the subsequent debates. Just as a, as a point of contention, I was just looking that up. And the other thing, realizing there were actually four of those, that's a whole other thing to think about as well. They had four debates, but um, you know the. But you're right. It's the you know it's the perception versus reality thing that kicks in so often when we're talking about what's going on here. So so what exactly will be our departure point? Is it going to be that the debate is judged differently and we're actually going to say that for whatever it's worth, makeup may have made the difference, Chris? Are we going to go there? Yeah, yeah, let's just say that. And like we said, um, the election results go a little bit different and Nixon's elected in 1961. Well, you know, 60 takes off at 61. So... Um, lead us down that path chris you're in the driver's seat well we already had one really good one um the i want to say may 61 vienna meeting uh number two and we've been all over it but let's just go ahead and jump right in cuba um first anybody who you know knows the name richard nixon knows he likes covert things um and i don't you know, so there's there's a couple of different issues here. First, with the Vienna thing, we said the missiles probably don't go in, but let's take that another step back. I'm not even convinced that Castro's there for the missiles to be to pick up the phone from Khrushchev or or or, or something along those lines. Um, the United States had been working on a plan to land a volunteer. Exile army um, in Cuba. The Kennedy administration comes in and inherits plans from the Eisenhower administration. Keep in mind which Nixon's a part of. Right. 
probably involved in the drafting of these plants um, and starts changing them. And a lot of those changes in the post-mortem of this invasion, of the Bay of Pigs invasion, it went wrong and everybody starts pointing at all of these different things, all of these different changes as what did, what caused it to go wrong. Um, they changed the location because they wanted it to be closer to Havana. They um, refused to provide air support, which, again, let's fast forward eight years. Richard Nixon is not shy about using the United States Air Force to do anything he wants. Um, so I think that's another interesting possibility there that those changes don't get made. The United States barrels right in at the Bay of Pigs and the Castro regime does not reach its, what would that be, third birthday? Yes. Don? So, 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 so no, uh, so no, uh, no Castro, no Cuba of the, the Cuba that we know of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and you know, and you know, we have you know, <laughs> there's that whole other historical what if that particularly ties to me because of baseball. You know, Castro wanted to be a pitcher in the, in the major leagues, and so if, if Castro just had a better curveball, maybe none of this happens either. But that's a whole other, you know, that's a whole other scenario. Mm -hmm. So. Are you suggesting there, Chris? I guess my question: Are you suggesting an in, an in, again a a more favorable, still probably authoritarian regime in Cuba, just coming into power as a result of support from the United States, or is it really more of a more of a more democratic Cuba? I, I don't think it's. I don't think the immediate result is a democratic Cuba. Um, one of the things thinking about the mindset and where the people planning this were coming from over in American secret services, they had already had a successful coup in Iran and in Guatemala, at least they probably had been involved in the 1948 Italian election in, well, that's a little bit different, but in those other two cases, putting in military strongmen. Um, and it worked for the short term. That's kind of what they wanted. That, that was their interest. If we do want, and you know, and you and I have talked about this, as you get further and further from the initial um, pebble hitting the pond, those waves get really weird. But I do think Cuba would have returned to what is more recognizable to Americans as the general stream of Latin American political development. Um. It would have had a military strongman. It would have been a an authoritarian country um, for a while. But when you look at what starts happening after you can no longer have the boogeyman of the Soviet Union, you know, a lot of those strong um, governments in Pinochet and Chile and the colonels in Argentina and all of those other countries, when the Cold War is over, the United States no longer sees the need to maintain so tight a control, so solid and authoritarian a government. And I think over time, you can see an opening there. But initially, you're, it, it's going to look a lot like Armas in Guatemala. Yeah. And, you know, to me, the other thing that I always think about with Cuba, what Cuba was before Castro came to power, what Cuba rose to be because of prohibition and because of other things, you know, what I think Cuba can still be again, even now, uh, you know, with the right scenario in terms of being much its proximity to the United States, you know, just across the straits there from Florida, you know, getting there quickly, Um you know, from a tourism standpoint or from just, you know, the other the other economics of what could go on there that were the economics before it became a communist nation, but could have easily been reversed back in the other direction. And, you know, there's, there's something to be said there eventually, as long as things are, you know, peaceful, this is a horrible thing to say because it's so anti-democratic, but as long as things are sort of, there's there's calm and there's peace and there's prosperity and the, the, the tide is bringing up all boats from you know the economy you know there's still going to be those that are that are less fortunate there 
But you, you have maybe a chance that Cuba could have taken a slightly different trajectory, I think, than some of the other Central American or South American countries, just because it had the ability to develop a relationship with the United States, I think that's different than a, than a Guatemala or that's different than, you know, some of what you mentioned there in South America, just because of what it had been before. It, it was different before and what it could have been again. I mean, at one point you could even make the argument that Cuba could have, be, you know, could have been annexed. I mean, this goes back to the Spanish American war. I mean, a different path for Puerto Rico than for Cuba. <laughs> they both could have gone down similar paths, you know, what, 60 years before. The, the one I don't, I don't really, well, it's a, I, I don't think the tourism is the way to think about that. And the reason I say that is just thinking about, I'm going to throw out Acapulco or other, you know, friendly, sunny destinations, very close to the United States that the United States has always had a friendly government relationship with. Um, just looking at the economics of that and how that works, you don't need a whole lot of people to keep those kind of things running so you don't have um, the kind of spread of a middle class right. that you would have in other scenarios. I agree. And, and you know, so again, it's, this is always the fun, the, the fun and the challenge of the what if game is, is trying to think, you know, how, what would have been different like I said, as you get further away from the initial rock hitting when you get several ripples out what's going on here. You know, but in the near term, you know, going back to the actual crisis itself, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis was a defining moment of obviously the Kennedy administration was a defining moment of the Cold War to a great degree. Uh, uh, what Chris has behind him is, is, is a black and white image from um, uh, Stanley Kubrick's uh, Dr. Strangelove, which, by the way, has a subtitle for those of you that don't know is uh, how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. But um uh, there's no fighting in the war room, Chris. Um, but the, um, uh, but you know, without that defining moment, what else gets defined? There would have been other defining moments. So you know, there would have still been clash between the, I believe, between the United States, between the between the Western Bloc and the Soviet Bloc, because there was going to be clash. This was this was the height, in many ways, of the Cold War. Um, you know, would uh, would for, the other thing that pops into my head, this is this is the tangent, but pops into my head almost immediately because of what's going on with private the private space race right now is, you know, does Nixon commit to a moonshot? You know, that you know, because in, as we know, uh, thinking about the Cold War, though, the Cold War was being played out in space. You know, it, the, the space race was, you know, was an extension of that showing technology that had military applications, obviously, but also the exploration part, you know, the, pu the publicity part of that would, uh, you know, uh, part of, you, you can make the argument that part of what saved the Kennedy presidency in a public sense was a lot of what was going on with what we, the success we were having in the, in, in the space race and some of the things that we're doing and the public image of that. And, you know, him making the, the, the announcement, you know, that led to the Apollo program and all of that, that was part of the, the visionary aspect, you know, of what we look back on Kennedy, you know, we, well, it's not called Cape Canaveral anymore. It's called Cape Kennedy. Kennedy. Um, just as another point, there's a really big NASA facility not far from you. Yeah. Uh, named after who? Named after Lyndon Baines Johnson. And the, last, the reason. The who, last who, president from Texas. Yep. You've heard and, me say that. <laughs> yeah. Who was, who was from Texas uh, in the sense of being really from Texas. Uh, and was obviously the vice president under Kennedy, which is why that came here. Well, he wasn't the only reason that came here. There were some other, you know, there were some other guys that were influential in Congress that made sure that was going to come here. But yeah, I mean, that 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 location is about when I'm actually in my office. But never mind. That was yeah. two years ago that we actually go to go to offices and things like that. But, uh, you know, the Kennedy's the Kennedy Space Center, the, the Johnson Space Center was a 15 minute drive from my office. Not very close. But you're right. It's uh, you know, that that came as a result of. Um, of Kennedy being Kennedy having the push towards the moon, Johnson being his vice president, you know, the, 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 the political payoff of, of getting that, that location in, in, you know, in, in a Texas, in a Texas location where it made sense. But um, yeah, so chasing a lot of field there, there, there's all these things that we just think it was being the logical progression of 
the United States and the Soviet Union's history in the early 60s that are very much colored around the Kennedy aspects here. And then, so the first question is, OK, Nick, Nixon wears makeup. Nixon wins the election. How much of, an, of the Nixon administration is a continuation of what had been the Eisenhower policy and the Eisenhower approach versus the possibility that Nixon's coming in now wanting to put his own unique special stamp onto that? But one of the things about Nixon, Nixon valued loyalty. I think Nixon valued being loyal, you know, particularly after the Checkers incident being one example of that. I mean, Eisenhower could have, you know, sent him packing on that alone, but didn't. So he valued, you know, so I think there's an element of Nixon that would want to carry forward with what he thought were the best parts of what had been the Eisenhower approach, you know, modified a little bit by Nixon's personality and his thoughts. But you would have seen, it would have felt like less of a shift as guess is what I'm taking a lot of words to try to say, not just because it was a shift in parties, because in some ways on foreign policy, the parties weren't that far apart, candidly, at that time. But a shift in personality uh, in terms of the foreign policy, I think, is a real thing. I, I, I agree very much that they're very close. And I would say I don't really see any change in space policy. Um, thinking about what had happened the United States, after World War II, took in the German scientist. You know, the German rocket program is really important to understanding the early space race. Right. The United States took in, and this is one of the other episodes, so I'm not trying to give too much away, um, that we've been thinking about for this. Again, because there's so many interesting things happening during this time frame. But the United States took in those German scientists. The Soviets captured, or the the program, the their Los Alamos, their their the headquarters of their rocket program was in the East German, was in the Soviet zone. So that that's what they got in the they, occupation. They they got the places, but they didn't get the people. Right, and so what wound up happening? The early Soviet space program they inherited a lot of those rockets. And that's one of the reasons they were able to get off to such an early head start with Sputnik and with other successes is because they inherited the equipment. They inherited the actual stuff. So they started with a head start. But thinking about, and that was almost lucky for us, to be perfectly honest, because if you think about, you know, Yes, the United States did not have a lot of space race successes under Eisenhower. But the argument I would say is in 1957, Eisenhower and Nixon, that administration, and building again off of that human capital that we inherited, did a lot of the groundwork. They did a lot of the overarching science they did a lot of the spending on national education. I mean, this was one of the first times that STEM, this was so early, they were still calling it seed. It wasn't even STEM yet. This was one of those early investments in engineering and in technology. And it was a huge deal in 57 that the Eisenhower and Again, like you said, this would be a continuation of that administration. They did a lot of that groundwork, and it just so happens that in 61, you start having John Glenn circling the earth, and you start having these things. I do feel like it was an inheritance of that strong foundation built under the earlier administration. I would say it's interesting to think. Nixon probably would have wanted to put his own stamp on it, but the, I agree with you on the loyalty aspect, but I would say that this feels like very, you know, I just laid out a really good way to understand the moonshot as a continuation of what we've already done, as opposed to this change. You're just changing to get back to the driving metaphor, you're just going a little bit further along the road that we're already on. It's the same car. You just put a different driver in the driver's seat. And I think that, you know, I think that's the hard thing for those of us. I mean, I'm born after that period of time and not I'm born in 68. So not long after that, but long enough after that, 
I think we have a tendency, and I still do, and even more so probably now today than I did before, to look back on this with more with more of the there there was partisanship. Let's be very clear. There was partisanship. There always has been American politics. But again, the, the divides between the parties were not as noticeable in, in certain areas then as they are today. You know, again, it, it may and, and part of that was the the fact that it was against the backdrop of the Cold War. So there was it wasn't, you know, there were there were the enemy was over there. The enemy wasn't the enemy wasn't, you know, the guy down the hall that you disagree with kind of thing so much. And I, I think I think we have that problem with that, you know, that's the first place. I, I think I associate I know that, you know, Sputnik in 57, the early Soviet successes, you know, I mean, it's not until, well, it's really not until 62, 63, maybe even a little bit later than that, that you can argue that the U.S. pulls ahead of the Soviets in some of the ways that things are happening. To your point, it was once there was funding now attached to this and there was a mission attached to this. It's a little bit like, you know, the World War II experience of you've awoken the giant now. Now you have to be careful about what you've done now that this is OK. This is what this is going to be. about. OK, now that we know this is what this is going to be about, this is what we're going to do about it kind of thing. So I, I think it is true that you would have seen that continuation. I don't see Nixon being viewed as quite the visionary, though, by a lot of the population on this. So would a would a Nixon would there have been a Nixon Apollo program? Probably. Would it have had the same? personality flair of the Kennedy announcement of Apollo program. My, my first place I go there, right or wrong, is probably not. And and probably not the same level of excitement about, about it in some of the public demeanor. Does that mean it turns out any different? Does that mean by July 69, we're not putting, you know, a man on the moon? Say, probably not. It, it works that way both ways. I also look at Nixon being more the pragmatist there. Because I think what would have what definitely did happen in again using the space race as sort of an analogy for this, maybe not the best thing to think about because of all the other ripples that could have happened that are far more important than this. But I think it also became became pretty clear by 65, 66, even as there's the setbacks, the Apollo one fire and some of the other things that happened there. For those that were in the know, it's pretty clear. The Soviets don't have the economic ability to keep up pace with this because of what it's doing to everything else they're trying to do. The U.S. is going to win this. Now, whether what that looks like as a win is a little, you know, a pragmatic Nixon at that point, maybe towards the middle, towards the end of a second term, assuming he's reelected in 64, which is a whole other thing to think about how hard it is to get for that, you know, vice president, assuming the presidency to actually get a full eight years because you've already you're tied to the eight years before that. Uh, C election of 1992 as an example of that in recent history is, um, you know, would would a pragmatic Nixon around 66 or 67? Yeah, we're going to continue to move down the path with this space thing here. But, you know, we're going to we're going to adjust it a little bit more. We're going to look to something that's not about this moonshot. Yeah, we're going to the moon because we ought to go to the moon. We want to be the first ones there. But let's start looking a little bit ahead of that because the irony is what I know about the space program, I know a little bit about it, is that Nixon inherited a program that had already hit its, well, it hits its highs actually once he becomes president, you know, by taking what's there before. That that was the fun thing. I just realized, I mean, we've been discussing this and discussing this. It was, it was Nixon in the Oval Office that talked to the astronauts on the moon. Yeah, but then it's also Nixon over the next couple of years as the public, you know, the public intensity and excitement about this is 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 waning to try to figure out, OK, you know, what do we do now? And part of that's because, you know, we had won, you know, next thing, you know, it's the it's the Apollo 13 problem. You know, the networks aren't even carrying our uh, networks aren't even carrying our little science show from space, you know, kind of deal. And, you know, so. I think that, you know, one of the one of the changes would have been and again, the space program may just be an exemplar of this and others that are there is I think Nixon would have been much more likely to pragmatically pivot on a lot of things moving forward than perhaps there were pivots naturally because it was a Democratic administration taking over from Republican administrations. There were natural pivots that happened early in the Kennedy administration about how things were going to be different. But I think you would have seen Nixon more gentle trajectory course changes over time, you know, moving towards the 64 election or moving towards you know, the 68 election. You know, one of the most interesting things to me that's an entirely different thing to think about is would be Nixon, Nixon during the civil rights movement. 
that that's one of the other things I wanted when we talked about, there's not much of a difference. I did. Th this is one thing that went through my mind. Um, and, and I was thinking about how to talk about this, but I, I really feel like Nixon's loss in 1960 really, really changed him and how he's viewed in American history. Um, the Richard Nixon of 1960 is again, very much carrying on that, um, Eisenhower, um, policy that, that administration. And while some people look at that and say, yeah, Eisenhower is a Republican, he's America's grandpa. And the 1950s were, kind of a let's go ahead and throw that jumping jumping the uh shark back in here the happy days right. um of you know conformity and all of that uh let's remember brown versus board was 1954 right and mr conservative deployed the united states 101st airborne division to little rock in 57 to enforce that integration um, so I feel like, again, yeah, things were moving there. Um, I feel like carrying on that policy, Nixon would have carried on that policy in a different way. I feel like Kennedy was a lot more flash, um, a lot more sizzle. Nixon was more bacon, but you know, I do feel like again, I, I always come back to to thinking about these two these two parties and these two presidents at this point. One party forcibly integrated Little Rock public um public high schools. One party sent a lawyer to ask very, very nicely for the governor of Alabama to allow. Old, uh, to allow his um, state colleges to be integrated. Which of those advance civil rights more? Yeah, well, the, which, the which thing, of those has more persuasive power? Well, and we've talked about this a number of times before. This is one of those episodes I wish we had uh, we had Brad along for the ride because I, I, you know, a lot of good reasons there. But you know, there there was there was the the stark divide in the Democratic Party, you know, the Dixiecrats. <laughs> You know, Kennedy had Kennedy as a sitting Democratic president had to deal with that, not just in the country, but in his own party. That was not something that that, right. that a sitting Republican, um, you know, elected in 1960, Richard Nixon would have had to deal with quite the same way. At that point, people still talked about the Rep you didn't you didn't have this kind of a really reaction when people said the Republicans were the party of Lincoln. Yeah, yeah, for, 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 for very good reasons there. And so if you want to talk about some of the real ripples that flow out of that, you know, to me, part of the irony now is, you know, the South tends to be from a voting block standpoint, you know, Republican now. Um, there was the, the solid Democrat, the solid Democratic South. That was actually a term that you could use back during this period of time. That that's the morph that's taken place, with the label sort of changing around some of the same ideology that still exists there. Right? We I, we understand I, how that works. I, I do think it's really interesting. We're talking about that this week when it was a national shocker that a Republican won back Virginia. That was yeah. a big deal, and yeah, yeah, and so. You know, when, when I think that through, I start thinking about, you know, if you change the course of the early 60s aspects around civil rights, which are about voting rights, which are about all kinds of other things, you know, if you change that trajectory there in some way, because it's just it's just even just the even if the even if the policy position is not changed, but the implementation of that policy, what you pointed out, are you sending in federal federal troops to enforce this? Are you sending in, you know, federal folks to recommend it and sort of oversee that it happens or doesn't happen at the local state level? I think you do see a different, you know, trajectory that goes along there. And, you know, does the 60s turn into the 60s quite the way that we think of the 60s? And of course, then the other part there, which we you know, dodged around here is, where is a 1960 elected Richard Nixon when it comes to the question of Vietnam? I mean, that because that's the other th these two things go hand in hand. In my opinion, if you don't understand the interaction between the domestic 
aspects of civil rights and voting rights and economic um, issues tied to the, the bigger foreign policy Cold War question, which is manifesting itself more than any other place right there in the Vietnam conflict. Um, you know, how, how are those two things different? Nixon is ultimately the one who extracts the United States from Vietnam. You know, now you might argue, would he have, you know, that's after the fact, that's after you need to clean up the mess that's already happened there, you know, so to speak. Uh, but, you know, and he, the, and he got us out by expanding that war. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Not, <laughs> not, not exactly by just withdrawing. So, you know, where is, you know, we, we were talking off podcast about, you know, probably what will be a different episode sort of in this series of looking at this, you know, in Vietnam itself. So I don't want to go too far there because I want to leave the room for that. Um, but the uh, but the whole question of what does the escalation or lack thereof, I still think it's an escalation, but what does the escalation of the Vietnam conflict look like in 1961, 62, 63 under President Nixon versus President Kennedy? I think they're different. First, what escalation? What are you talking about? You were talking about the escalation of the United States involvement in Vietnam. We weren't in Vietnam till 64, so we're talking about rather than President Johnson. Yeah, that, 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 that's true, but the stage was set in the years right. before that. I mean, you know, right. in terms of getting ahead of that. I mean, it, you know, the other interesting thing about just, you know, Kennedy, you talked about this, I think, in the intro, one of the shortest presidencies, mm-hmm. you know, on, on record. Uh, you got to have people, you know, catching cold at their inaugurations to have them be in office, you know. Literally, than that, this. Was, that was the shortest. Um, and then Garfield. Yeah. So those are the only two shorter. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, but, you know, a lot of what we think about, again, the quote unquote Kennedy administration or, or what we think of as being, you know, the outflow of the Kennedy administration were Johnson making those things a reality. The Voting Rights, the Voting Vi- Rights Act, a good example, happens because Johnson's president. You know, in some ways, Kennedy gets credit for it, which is, you know, the irony of it, I guess. And to he me. shouldn't. But, but you know, that was Johnson. Mm-hmm. That was Johnson's ability to move legislation through Congress because of me and Lyndon Johnson. Voting Rights Act, um, Head Start, improvements to Social Security, yeah, yeah, Medicaid, you know, all of it. Yeah. None of it should go to Kennedy. That's, yeah, so, you know, the don't great like so- talking opinions. That's my opinion. Yeah, gr- gr- great, great society <laughs> is the great society is properly attached to Johnson as an extension of many of the things that, you know, Kennedy wanted to do. And then Johnson actually took it, you know, steps further. Uh, just you know, going back to our historical what if, because that's what we do here is what does that look like under a Nixon administration? So are we talking about what does Nixon's domestic social policy look like? Or are we talking about what does Nixon's Vietnam policy? Let's, we'll talk, about the both domestic, of them. let's talk about the domestic social thing. OK, um, I actually think it could be very, very similar. Um kind of coming from where I am in the world, what I do for a living. Uh, Nixon signed OSHA. Nixon signed the Environmental Protection Act. He was not a small government conservative. In his social policies, he largely, Nixon's campaigns, Nixon's elections later on are really important, kind of a shift from the earlier to the late you know it, it's an inflection point in modern american politics where one party really does where the parties really do take up some different sides at this point you know um gee, john kennedy was the tax cutter in this race um i feel like you know this might be one of those instances when it's not as much the individuals as, as the person in the Oval Office, as much as it is, I'm going to call it the new, De- the new Deal consensus, this collaboration, co- collaborative um, sense in the United States, in the American political class that we need we need government government defeated fascism government can defeat the depression government can defeat communism and that kind of does cut across political lines 
in this point, I think Nixon is going to look like a Johnson. He's that pragmatist, that arm twister, that political horse trader that passes legislation rather than an idealist who makes nice speeches. Yeah, it's it's more the, you know, again, <laughs> where does this tie over to the Vietnam analogy? It's more the boots on the ground. How do you get it done kind of thing, right? Versus the, the, the big picture plan. And you know, the, the thing that I find, you know, the most interesting there that goes with that, because we're going to hold off on the Vietnam thing to let that be its, its own, own standalone thing. I, I We'll come back to it in this episode. There's a couple of things I want to. OK, yeah. <laughs> but the but the other thing that jumps at me, you know, that immediately jumps out there is this really just popped into my head. You know, Nixon's influence on American politics in the macro long term picture will be always labeled by one word that begins with a W and ends with a er gate, ter gate, yes. Watergate. That that will be the Nixon legacy. You know, 200 years from now, when people read about Nixon in the first paragraph, when students study him, Watergate will be in that the first couple of sentences of that first paragraph for the reasons that it will be. Um, could you have had something like a Watergate type of scandal, you know, in a Nixon presidency in the 60s? Could no. have. But probably not, because I, what, I will say no, because what had what had happened that caused that to be what it was by the time of, you know, 68 and following was different than it was in 60. Those eight years make a big difference because of what had happened in the real timeline. And so, again, Nixon and also you talked about his age. Nixon would have left the presidency, assuming that he had two terms. What in his m- mid to latter 50s, he would have been he would have been short of 60. And so you would have had Nixon kicking around. Think about the famous thing. They don't have Nixon to kick around anymore. We would have Nixon kicking around, you know, under even under a two term scenario, depending on what happened there. But from 68 on as a guy who probably has a 20 to 25, 30 year post presidency lifespan, um, you know, as an influential figure, it would have been an interesting, you know, just what happens as a result of when he's not in office. With him still being around, not the disgraced Nixon, but the even if he only serves one term and he's gone in '64, you know, in, or '65, you know, the 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 shadow of Nixon on American political history, on the Republican Party, on a lot of other things would be very different just by the changing the '60 election. So, there's two things I completely agree, and I think this is a really interesting topic. There's two paths to go down, and I promise I'm going to go down both of them. One is Nixon the man. Um, knowing his history, knowing him as a person, and, and I've talked about it before, I really believe the candidate in 1960 and the candidate in 1968 are essentially personality-wise very, very different people. Um, we're going along the makeup debate route, but one of the other suggestions we had was that and and this is one of those other things that people know about um, Chicago, the 1960 election. Illinois basically went for Kennedy because Chicago machine politics. They they got on the phone to the board of elections, found out how many Republican votes were coming in in Springfield and Southern Illinois, and they made sure that that, that many Democratic votes came out of Chicago. Um. And as a person, I feel like, you know, I have trouble saying this, but if you look at his history, right, Nixon grew up in Whittier, California. His father was a shopkeeper, ran what would, in in a sense, be a gas station. I do have trouble saying that he went to the less elite Duke University Law School. Duke is is elite, okay? Again, grew up not far from there. Duke's elite, but... He didn't go to Harvard, and there was always that sense in so much of what Nixon did, this real emotional sense of being held out of what's rightfully mine by this little clique of elitist. If you were sitting there trying to 
put together a caricature of who Nixon hated in his life. It's John Kennedy. He, 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 he is the poster child for all the things that were, were, were Nixon's demons. Right. And you mentioned the you're not going to have Nixon to kick around anymore. I, I feel like that sense that he had his election stolen from him leads to that and and that actually is not after he loses the presidential election that's after he loses the california governor's race in 62 right this this sense you know what he's a very intelligent very complex man but it almost feels like a kid flipping over his lego set saying fine i'm gone i'm not playing this game anymore and the effect that all of that had on him and on his personality, on his secretiveness. When you look at Daniel Ellsberg and a lot of the Washington Post reporters and a lot of these people that are really involved in the Watergate scandal, man, as a person without having that trauma of feeling like you had that stolen from you you're a very different personality when you're in office in watergate so no you you don't have that he was a loyal person but he didn't have that bunker mentality that right. i think he picked up later um the other thing I, I i find interesting to to discuss is the wider american political sense it, and it touches on what I was talking about earlier with that almost New Deal consensus. But it feels like Watergate was the end of that. This idea that, you know, in 1932, Hoover's like, you know what? Government cannot do so much. FDR comes in. No, government can. We can expand government. Government can, can have a positive effect in people's daily lives and part of the um importance of that sense is a trust that government is working for the collective interest and i think that one of the things that watergate did was it exposed corruption it was a huge government scandal it really helped it really broke down that trust between, and it helped Vietnam. You know, Viet Watergate is very hard to explain because part of it's about Vietnam and part of it's about all these other things going on. Vietnam definitely played a role in that, but it helped break down that trust between the American people and their government so that not that long afterwards you can have a presidential candidate saying to somebody the scariest phrase in the world is i'm from the government and i'm here to help that that that's a very foreign concept to a voter in 1960 right. and and again it's how much of that was well a lot of that was watergate right i mean mm -hmm. without a doubt but how much of that was also the way the 60s played out and you know the things that happened there so again it's these small you know, nudges in trajectory, I think, that make a big difference. And, you know, the thing that keeps running through my head, Chris, is in some ways we may have struggled to get around this topic because it's so big and yet it all seems to circle and tie together, is that a Nixon presidency, as we've talked about here, is not so different than a Kennedy pre presidency in some ways in terms of policy, perhaps, in terms of the broad policy. Mm -hmm. It's the personality of how that's played out that's different. So, you know, Things are different, but they're the same. And so that it's figuring out what's actually different that's actually meaningful. And in some cases, I think, again, with Nixon, because this is what this focus of this episode is about and this point of departure is, an earlier Nixon is just a different Nixon, like you say, without having the other things that have happened in the intervening period, which changes, you know, if you want to view an, the Nixon style of governing, quote unquote, as president from his tenure elected in 68 and apply that to if he'd been elected in 60 that's an unfair thing to do in my mindset because it, as you point out it's a different richard nixon in 68 than it was in 60 and a different and, and, and i think we just and really a different a really, and a different right. and a different country that's we, moved in those we did years. have a really good discussion of those is it forces or is it people it's both i think we can say it's both this is a really good example of how both things have changed Right. 
and and how the, and how together they they amplify each other's change at the same time which you know it's what often happens there one one change by itself would be substantial but the two of them together are more than the sum of their parts there's an x there's a there's a multiplication of their parts to produce what's there and you know it's to me it's always interesting when i think back on you talked about the happy days phenomena the 50s sort of happened there at the very end of the 50s and the early 60s and what we think it was being the quote-unquote 60s was really the very late 60s and was really the early 70s you know those labels we would apply to the decades are just slightly off off you know offline there to some degree if you look at a picture of fashion in 64 65 you know it ain't, it ain't a bunch of bell bottoms and, and and flower flower power kind of stuff it still looks a lot more like what we think of as being you know the 50s per it, se the beatles wore suits when they got off the plane it, in 64 exactly in fact the beatles are a great example of if you look at just the the history which is a fairly short history as well the history of that band is that you you see what's going on in culture you know reflected by their performances you know what were they wearing what were they doing what were they, and what were they talking about uh you know is also there as well and so you know when i when i think about again you know back to our original point of deflection when i think about you know what it would have meant uh for nixon to be elected in 60 i think it's probably in the big picture of things a lot of things that happened happened they just happened slightly differently they happen a slightly different way but I, I do believe that the parties, the American political parties as we know them today, would not quite be what they are today if you make this change in 1960. I think that's actually with more subtle uh, ripples out of this, but it's probably one of the more um, important ripples is, you know, the Democratic Party would have had to go back, especially if they lost the presidency in 60, they would have had to go back and sort of reinvent who they were for a 64 election. They would have had to re rethink that. You know, the status of what's going on with civil rights and the Dixiecrats, you know, would you have, would there be an earlier move towards a rise of, uh, you know, Republicans in the South because of what's going on there? Probably not. I think you would have seen more of a actually a reversal of that of where you know the democrats would have been stronger sort of um coalesced around their more uh their less friendly to civil rights personalities and would have become in some ways maybe even more of a minority party in much of the country how does that you know how does that play out over the long haul i don't know i just I, know I, that the parties look different today i think if you change 1960 i i feel like it leads to a switch it, it just we still have the same parties we do you just changed the letter, I feel like, um, because I do feel like one of the things I talked about was a strong, a strong and confident federal government willing to go into the South and enforce court rulings, which the liberal Northeastern John Kennedy and, and this this will set up very nicely the, 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 the la one thing I definitely wanted to. To talk about here but but um it took nixon to go to china correct it took somebody who was a hardcore anti-communist who had made his name doing that to open up china um john kennedy was not the person who politically could do civil rights with a firm hand the South would have screamed it's another civil war. I think one of the really important, one of the really big things that Johnson was able to do was to explain his own history as, you know, I'm not going to say a Southerner because I know Texas is its own special thing. You're your own country, fine, but you're still somehow America's team. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but that coming from a very different region and a very different life experience. Having done that, um, Johnson was able to do things that Kennedy would not have been able to do. And I think a Nixon coming from a stronger, you know, a stronger perspective, not having to hold his own party together would have been able to, like I said, take some of the, I mean, really, when you hear about it, shockingly strong action to enforce civil rights and that would have almost kicked the democrats back into the south but 
you still have that argument over big or small government. And I think the Democrats would have become a party of states rights. I think I think which, that I think that's a fair I think that's a fair assertion. And I also think, you know, in this in this departed timeline of history, there is a scenario, as I mentioned before, you know, Nixon being reelected in 64, I don't think is 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 an automatic by any stretch of the uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, so I, I still think you have the possibility of uh, of a Johnson being elected in 64. It, it, you, you could still end up with the same in 19 in by by you know by January of 1965 it, it's still Lyndon Johnson who's uh who's being sworn in uh to become the president it's just the path there was not through inheriting the presidency as the vice president following an assassination and then you know winning it on your, on your own terms it, it's the it's that logical thing the republicans have held the office for 12 years Johnson coalesces the other part of the Democratic coalition around that. He's and, able, and by he's the able way, to make the, make the case, like you say, of you know, I, let me tell you my experience with this thing. You know, when it comes to to, to equality and civil rights, and 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 carries the day on that. You know, it's a departure, but maybe it's not that far of a departure. A Johnson would have been much more popular in the Democratic primary of 1960 than he would have been. Because there would have been this sense of, man, we cannot do another elitist. We we have to get kind of a back to the base thing. And the other thing is very much thinking about what Johnson's presidency was like. Um, Johnson's presidency now becomes really interesting because you're not stuck with this. Okay, fine. Let, let's let's do some Vietnam talk for a second. You're not stuck with this sense that um, Kennedy held Vietnam. I'm the one that lost it. I'm not going to be the one that le- that lost it. And I've got all of your old advisors around me. I can't fire these people. The, the sense that I've got this and they're all against me and all of this baggage and overhang from how he became president. He doesn't have that. So I think that really does change Johnson's personality and and Johnson's decisions he makes in getting the United States again. You know, let's let's ignore this next episode we've got coming up and and say that the um, Vietnam, the South Vietnam, the Southeast Asian situation that Johnson inherits on. Um, January 20th to, um, 1964 is the same as he inherited in our timeline. Let's assume none of that changes. By the way, big assumption, whatever. Um, the decisions he makes going forward are very different. Right. And so, you know, it's, again, we, we, it's amazing to me how often this happens when we go back and do the historical what ifs. There's a small detour, but you somehow find your way back, back to the same highway, right? And it, it, it it, it looks a little bit different and it's going to act a little bit different, but you know, it's there's again, this is that macro force thing. The macro forces are such there that they're hard for an individual, you know, to fight against. And I think that gets harder the further down we go in a modern time. Yeah. I, I, I genuinely don't know, Chris, you know, what happens there. That's different. I, I, I tend to think that in some ways Vietnam is inevitable in the sense of there, you know, there had to be something that, you know, because of the cold war and you got to stand against this you know the domino theory concepts of around the world southeast asia certainly fits that um so i I don't think it but i think that there are different flavors of vietnam even if it's inevitable there's very different flavors of vietnam that can happen where it doesn't become you know what it is in our in our real timeline uh, in, in terms of uh you know it's it's 2021 vietnam is still a shadow over um the united states united states foreign policy to a degree it's a shadow over you know united the united states political history the other things that go with that um um anyway it's i i, I it's one of those things i just don't know because there's yeah. just so many variables that are there but i do know what what i do know is how we talk about when you when you say the word Nixon now, again, way back to the original premise here, when you say the word Nixon, what gets conjured up by a lot of people 
is one thought in their head and it's going to be around Watergate and it's going to be around, I'm not a crook. And it's going to be around, you know, an element of paranoia, <laughs> you know, whatever it's going to be. If Nixon's elected in 1960 and whether he serves for one term and almost pretty much whatever happens there or two terms or whatever, the perception of Nixon would be very different than the one we have today. Not just because he was, because he was president in both scenarios, but how he came mm -hmm. to the presidency, what happened during the presidency, and how his personality would have played out through the presidency is, you know, is interesting to me. You know, the other thing that immediately jumps to my mind, that's probably a whole other thing. This whole month is about Kennedy, right, to a degree. We haven't talked about him. Yeah, is that, you know, which leads me to the immediate thing of thinking about what would we be talking about Kennedy's or quote unquote, Kennedy or quote unquote Kennedy's under this scenario, you know. Kennedy, Kennedy doesn't, Kennedy doesn't get shot in 63 because he's not the president. You know, is he back in 64? Is he happy just to be, does he go, is he more the path of what a Ted Kennedy becomes a longstanding member of the Senate? You know, his influence comes from that, you know, aspect of things, you know, it's, it's easy to say, well, it would have been different for Nixon would have been different for Kennedy. Mm -hmm. Kennedy would probably be alive. You know, that, uh, well, you know, would have been alive much longer. Yes. We're in 2021. Now yes, we're yeah. pushing credulity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> not now, but I'm talking he would have been he would have been alive past November 22nd of 1963, right. I think. Right. And, you know, and ultimately, I think, you know, based upon some of the things that we know now that are because of the assassination and things that led to that, you know, maybe he would have left politics in disgrace because of scandals tied to all the things that, you know, we we know now that maybe would have come out or not. Um, you know, so it's a change for Nixon. It's obviously a change for Kennedy, the loser then of the election. And, you know, would there be, would there be, would there be a, I don't think there would be a, an airport in New York named after, named after John oh, F. Kennedy. He'll be out a while. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, would there even be schools anywhere, maybe outside of Massachusetts that are named after Kennedy? Probably not. You know, I don't know. The, the thought, just another wonderful, hilarious thing went through my mind. Um, Boston, we have a problem. Um, Henry Cabot Lodge, Nixon's vice president, was also from Massachusetts. So imagine that line in Apollo 13. <laughs> but as a side note, um, <laughs> um, I, I don't know how long. I First, I do feel like a lot of the historical bomb throwing, historical revelations about Kennedy's life is part of a reaction to the that lens of kind of a post-Watergate looking at politicians as, oh, they're all just in it for themselves. And hey, look at this and look at that and all these things. Um, I would say I don't know how much longer Kennedy survives. And the reason I say that is, you know, one of the things we touched on is he was, despite the appearance in the televised debate, he was a sick man. Yeah. He had medical issues. So maybe it's more of a RFK and a Ted Kennedy carrying that torch. I don't know. Without any outsider, I don't know how if 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 JFK becomes that lion of the Senate. I, I find it doubtful, and the the reason is I think it would have been more of again assuming I'm working on the assumption here that Johnson has a good chance of being you know a, if if not the, the winner of a 1964 election at least a participant in that that alters what's there, you know. So, but if Johnson leaves the Senate. Uh, this, it's going to be somebody that, particularly if he's the president, that he's installed or that he grooms or that he works with in that Senate that's going to rise to prominence there. Uh, it's probably not going to be the senator from uh, the senator from Massachusetts that's fitting that role. Um, or the senator from New York. Don't forget they bought that seat, too. Yeah, it, yeah, <laughs> it's. Uh, you know, to, to me, it's it, it's somebody different. It, it's maybe somebody we know or somebody we can figure out, or maybe it's somebody we don't even know who that would, you know, who that would be when we look back on it now. Maybe eventually it still is, though, because keep in mind, yes, Johnson is going to put his person in. I mean, 
thinking about the 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 dates on this, Ted Kennedy in our modern mind was a lion of the Senate in like 2008 when he was working with Obama. He was a lion of the Senate in the 90s, in the 80s. He, he, That's he enough was, time for Johnson's person to have their time in the sun. Yeah. And move on. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, from from my perspective and this fits in, you know, from my early memories, moving from, you know, my teen years to early adult, you know, by the time that Kennedy runs in 80, 80. I get 80. Yeah. Uh, he's obviously you know, he's trading on the Kennedy name at that point, meaning the, the broader Kennedy name, you know, um, two older brothers that are, you know, that are fallen heroes of American politics. If you look at it from one optic or one point of view, but he's also trading on some of his own work in in the Senate. Of course, you could argue he got to the Senate because of again, th- this is how all of this stuff gets complicated. Is You know, is is Ted Kennedy, the senator from uh, from Massachusetts, if. You know, JFK is still around or or Bobby maybe becomes the senator from Massachusetts versus, you know, going to New York. How all of that plays out, I don't know. But um, I, I do think that there are different figures that rise to prominence and you the, the Kennedy name would exist and it would still have influence because it goes all the way back to goes all the way back to dad and his his role and stuff and, and what he did without a doubt. But nowhere close to what's here. I mean, if you don't have that, if you don't have JFK's election in 1960, you don't have the shadow, the same shadow cast by the Kennedys on American politics all the way down to 2021. Yeah. Do you have do you have influence? No doubt. They're, they're an influential family that had political influence before that ni- 1960 election, without a doubt. But I think it's a different path. I think it's a, thinking through it, someone who was you know born and raised in Texas. And you're right. Texas is the South, but it's not. That's also one of the interesting things about <laughs> Texas. Texas is Texas is the South and the West, and it's not the Southwest. It's, it, it's, it's, it's both of these things. Yeah. Just talk to your electrical grid. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a whole <laughs> other thing. But, you know, for example, where I'm at in Houston, we're about as far West as you can grow and grow some of the cotton and some of the crops that were traditional Southern mm-hmm. crops. We're far enough East that we're not really in true cattle country in quite the same way. So we straddle these two cultures and, and, and economics and, you know, even just climatology type of stuff. But, you know, Southern politics to me would look very different under the scenario that we're talking about here. Um, I'm not sure that there's, I'm not sure where there's, you know, where is Strom Thurmond in this alternate timeline, you know, once time passes over time. Still in the Democratic Party. Yeah. He found his home there. And and the question is, is that Democratic Party winning anything on the national level at that point because of what's happened, right? Yes. Yes, it is because it has morphed into a smaller government states' rights party, which, by the way, is working out semi-well in not just the South, but in, you know, the West as well for the party that did adapt that. Yeah, it's, yeah, so to your point, the the parties sort of switch identities, perhaps, in terms of, in terms of what's there. Uh, So we, you know, we'd be talking... Trying to get the idea, you know, I, I can imagine conservative Democrats because we've had them, we've had them in history, we've had them in, you had them in Texas, and still to some degree actually do, but you know that that idea of you know the liberal, you get the, the label liberal Republican, you know that's mm-hmm. that would be I think more the norm that you would see and under this alternate timeline, or I actually want to tend to believe that there might have still been a little bit more of consistency towards the middle from both parties just over time because there might not have been some of the radical upheavals that caused more of the divide to take place would there eventually have been more of a division sure but you know watergate really alters the landscape in so many ways you know there is no president there's no jimmy carter in the white house if there's no watergate um and so that's you know for better or for worse, that's an element of what is the the in the United States was a part of the Democratic the, the big D Democratic legacy in the United States is influenced by that that four year administration and what happens during that administration and um, you, you know, the other things that go with that. I mean, it's you know, I actually just you now think about the number of people that rose to prominence because of Watergate. You know, Howard Baker is a is a senator from Tennessee, but he's not Howard Baker. Um, you know, without George the Watergate H. hearings, probably. 
George H. W. Bush. Yeah, I mean, it, very, very, you know, okay. But he was able to rise to prominence because Watergate kind of blew up a certain strata of Republican politics. Yeah. And, you know, so, wow, we've come a long way afield from where we started. But again, that's yeah. the whole point is once you drop that one little pebble in the pond, like you used as the analogy, the ripples get. And the ripples start interacting with the, you know, the, the bank bounces back some ripples and suddenly you got some other stuff and, going on. And, and that's just the, you know, I've, I've been thinking about working this in something that people don't consider, but a huge deal for Richard Nixon. We haven't even mentioned the I'm going to say third, you know, economy, population, land. How do you measure this? One of the third huge, major, important countries in the world, even at this point. China. Yeah. And, and what's yeah. going on in that country? Nixon, like I said, was able to go to China in 72 because Mao was in charge. Mao was not in charge of China in 1960. He had just had to resign from the party after the Great Leap Forward. So how does that relationship play out? Because it's kind of what I was saying earlier, where you need somebody on the other end of the phone. And this is one of those really interesting things about he would have wanted to, but would he have had the partner that he was able to find in 1972? Right. Yeah. And, and, and you're right earlier when you said you, Nixon is uniquely yeah. positioned. Nick, Nixon could go to China because nobody was going to question his his ideological you know, bona fides when it mm-hmm. came to uh, you know, being, being anti-communist. Right. You know, no, right. No, nobody. No, <laughs> nobody's going to be able to put that label on, on, put a communist label on Nixon and have it stick. Right. It, it just ain't going to work, and a little bit harder for for somebody else to do it. Yeah. So you're right. So you know, geopolitics globally now, the position of China relative, to, and you know, and, and the things that happen after that. You know, it, it, you know, because that that was in some ways China getting, you know, China getting to come out to to play on the big stage in a way that was, you know, was recognized, you know, prior to that, it was still the question of what China are you even recognizing or talking about? Right. 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 So, yeah. Um, I think we've had a really good, I, I really like this episode because I think it touched on a lot of what we want to do with this. I'm going to call it story arc with, we, we definitely pulled on a lot of those threads We've literally remade the entire international order and American political party system. So that's always a good thing when you can do that over a little bit of, you know, makeup, um, some foundation. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm now destined to try, I'm now destined to try to do an Internet search to see if I can find out who the makeup artist was for that. You know, just just for that. If you, if you find it in the show notes, you know, it's successful that I was able to Google through it. If not, then uh, then you don't. Just to give everybody a context, I'm going to jump in here if I can, just a little bit, Chris, and thanks for leading on the show today. Uh, just been going through a lot of uh, readjustments and a lot of things. So you notice we've missed some episode releases. It's not our intent. We're trying to get everything back in line, and Chris has been helpful in terms of doing that. So just want to extend apology to our listeners. Mm-hmm. We've been very proud about our consistency, and we've slipped a little bit here, so we're trying to get it back. Uh, but also, one of the things we had we're doing here was the idea that this would connect with our other show, our other podcast, which is the room where it happened. And we're still going to do an episode that actually focuses around the next room is supposed to be uh, Parkland. And so I think we'll still actually release that. It'll just be released in, we thought it was going to release in October as a prelude to this on a fork in time. And now it's probably going to be parallel to it. So you'll see that. Plus we already have an episode planned for November. So November probably gets a room where it happened, double whammy, which is good. That'll play a little catch up. You know what? I will go ahead and say this. And Don and I were mentioning this. Um, we're huge fans of uh, Dan Carlin. Everything he does is amazing. And, you know, he and I have been talking about his latest episode and I, I happened to mention to him, I finally listened to his three hour tome on the end of the war in the Pacific on a family trip. I was driving to a vacation. So really, this is the perfect time for us to be releasing double content episodes. <laughs> go ahead, put on the podcast, get in the car and go see grandma. 
Yeah, it's 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 just in time for Thanksgiving. You'll have you'll have uh, assuming everything's good with COVID situation, so that travel can be what it needs to be for folks or wants to be that we're there. But uh, again, we do, we do appreciate our listeners, and I actually intended several times just to get a recording out to say, hey, hold tight. You know, things are just shifting around. Uh, for those of you that know a little bit, you know, my daughter was an important part of founding the podcast. She's now engaged, so she's heavily engaged in wedding preparations and other things. And we've had just some some other things that have been happening around this. So I just wanted to get that out and say thank you to our listeners. I appreciate Chris. Chris, uh, Chris is a result of what Alexis and I have talked so many times and what we've enjoyed about going through this experience. We met Chris because of a fork in time and meeting Chris has been a fun thing. I enjoy talking to Chris. We talk for hours off podcasts when we have a chance to do these types of things uh, we can disagree and agree about a lot of things there. And I've really enjoyed getting to know people as a result of this, Eric and Brant, some of the others you heard us mentioned by name, uh, people that I didn't know, but also having people that I do know and have reconnected with in my life that I've brought back from high school that are now occasionally on shows like a, like a Robert who's joined us a couple of times on uh, the room where it happened as a good example of that. So uh, I just want to just get that in here late just to say thanks to our listeners. You'll see more consistency here as it should be because it's an important part of what we do. But it's also Chris moved and scheduled this time and, and pushed forward on it and made it happen. And I'm not sure it would have because of what I'm dealing with in, in work and other sort of personal areas without that. So I, I'm, I'm appreciative of Chris. That's the other thing I want to say is not just thank you to my listeners, but thank you to Chris. Uh, for getting this moved forward and um, and do send us your suggestions a lot of the things that a lot of things that that spark what we do are indirectly off of those suggestions and we'll get around to a lot of what i was mentioning like the the eisenhower heart attack thing that was that was somebody's you know particular suggestion so when you brought up eisenhower's health stuff i didn't know if chris had seen that note but yeah somebody's actually suggested that would make a good topic and, I, and I'll, well, I'll actually put a note in the, sh- I'll put a link in the show notes to uh, Hardcore History, which is where you'll find mm-hmm. Dan Carlin's stuff. And if you are a fan of history, particularly military history, but history in general, um, he comes with, he comes with his ideological bend for those of you that know the other things that he does. But when it comes to delivering history, I think he works incredibly hard to be fair and to be thorough. And um, yeah, I, I do strongly recommend um the uh, his six part series looking at the um, the rise of japan before and then the, the situation through uh, the second world war it's it's informative uh it's harrowing at places uh some of the descriptions i'll say there chris you know i was thinking when you mentioned that i was thinking back vivid things in my head from listening to that over the last few months of the um of infantry actions on the islands in the pacific um uh, you you cannot listen to that and not be impacted by it. it, it it's just literally that, you know, that simple. But I, I do recommend not just Supernova in the East, which is what that six part series is, but other stuff that he's done there as well. And yeah, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's on my podcast list. And by the way, do, do check out, uh, if you like the idea of history, I mentioned foundation here, uh, the Isaac Asimov um, adaptation that Apple plus is mm. doing. As I'm watching that and hadn't read the books for 30 plus years, at least, I was reminded of, oh, yeah, psycho history. How do you decide how history is going to flow? Is it individuals or is it the mass? But we talk about it all the time on Fork in Time that, you know. And, and I think this has been a really good episode to talk about that because we've really talked about both the personal personality of Nixon and of Johnson and of a Ken. All of this has really tied in nicely to a lot of that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, while I'm on my science fiction kick here, some of you may be familiar that uh, Denis Villeneuve's version of Frank Herbert's classic science fiction novel, Dune, is out now. If all of you, if some of you have only ever seen the 1984 uh, Lynch adaptation, uh, first of all, read the book. There's a reason everybody keeps doing this in popular media is the book is fantastic. And if you've only seen the, the media adaptations there, but again, the first thing that popped into my head, there was exactly the same thing. That story is primarily about can one individual shape or reshape history as well. So I'd be encouraged just to hear the feedback from our listeners, just on that concept we've talked about so many times, which is the broad sense of, um, 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 of, the sweeps of history versus the, you know, the particulars of history. Chris, you're driving here. So I'm going to give you back the wheel. Anything you want to say to listeners before we close it out? 
Uh, yeah, just just one quick little thought I have. Um, I was hoping you wouldn't talk about my background, but because because I thought it was a great closer for this. Um, I you know we we record these on Zoom, and uh, currently have a Zoom background up of the War Room from Doctor Strange Love, released in 1962. Very much a part of what we're talking about, and the thought I have is. It, 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 it's interesting thinking about, you know, the fork we developed for this. Um, if you're sitting here listening to it in a podcast format, you have one experience of this. When if you're seeing me coming to you from the war room with the map of the bombers going in, you have a different experience. So I thought that was a nice little. Yeah. And the other thing, the thing that crossed in my head there is uh, I was because we were talking a little bit about Cuba and the Cuban Missile Crisis is. And then we talked about the space race and how all this connects together in you need to have the reason the Soviets want to put missiles in Cuba in the early 60s is Cuba is close. Those missiles can hit the United States. The reason the trade off there are missiles in Turkey is those are capable of, of hitting the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. The idea that we have and you, you say that it's the bombers in in Dr. Strangelove, you know, see the uh, the slim slim Pickens character, you know, the. Uh, that's actually one of my favorite scenes. I'm, I'll try actually try to find a YouTube thing of that. That's one of my favorite things when he's going through the checklist of there on the plane. It was a combination Bible, Russian phrase book. Is that how he refers to it? If I'm thinking correctly, yep. and, and and that you can have a good time in Vegas with this stuff. Yeah, yeah that was. And uh, but that that's the bomber area. So there's this question about the bomber gap and the missile gap, which was even in the debate there. The technology of the space race means that by 15 years later, you know, talk about Cuba. Cuba becomes unnecessary once you've got intercontinental ballistic missiles because you don't need a missile base there. You know, it's the, you know, the timing aspects of this, you know, around all how these things play together to me is to me, it's one of, the, that's one of the most fascinating periods in history is that you don't have a Cuban missile crisis in the 70s because by that time you've got ICBMs and it doesn't matter how you, you don't have to be close. Yeah. You know, you yeah. got the strategic triad, the bombers, uh, you know, missile subs now even, you know, to do to do the other part of the work. And all of that plays together in, in, in this background that we've been talking about. That that, that was that was a bonus. I, but you mentioned it. I couldn't get it out of my head because I see the tracks. Those are not the tracks of incoming missiles. Those are the tracks of where the bombers would be. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Oh, so, yeah. Again, I always love, you know, at the end of all these episodes, Don asks. Me if, there's, if there's anything I've gotten and, and and so many times I just look at them and I say we've just remade everything like like we've completely touched on everything uh what else do you want out of me I, yeah there you go I, <laughs> I think we've had a really good episode and uh I think we've also you know like I said pulled tugged on a lot of the threads that we're gonna have in the upcoming episodes for everybody to listen to on their Thanksgiving and or Christmas you know travels there you go all right Take us home, Chris. All right. Um, I, you know, you, you say this every time, and and you and I have talked about this with your baseball feelings. I have trouble quoting a Yankee, but let's go ahead and say it. Um, if somebody were to come to just a single fork in the road, what should they do? My suggestion is they should take it. All right. Uh, look forward to hearing from people and getting out some more podcasts for you guys. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more and provide feedback by visiting our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Connect to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash A Fork in Time or follow us on Twitter at A F I T podcast. If you want to support the show financially, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash A Fork in Time. We hope you will join us next time.